Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the first item of business is portfolio questions, education and skills. Question number one, John Mason. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether children in Glasgow must demonstrate greater needs than those in other parts of Scotland in order to gain access to an additional sport for learning school. John Swinney. Presenting officer, children and young people should learn in the environment which best suits their needs. The legislation places a duty on local authorities to provide education in a mainstream school unless specific exceptions apply. In summary, these include the education provided in a mainstream school would not be suitable for the aptitude and abilities of the child in question. Mainstream education would be incompatible with the provision of efficient education for other children and placing the child in a mainstream school would incur unreasonable levels of public expenditure. This applies across the whole of Scotland. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply, but it does appear to be easier for families in richer council areas and for families who are perhaps better off and more self-confident to argue their corner and get their child into a special school. John Swinney. The, the, the conditions and criteria that I set out in my original answer to uh, Mr Mason apply right across the country, and those are specified in, in, uh, in statute. Uh, so obviously it is up to individual local authorities to make a judgment based on these uh, conditions as to whether or not the educational needs of a young person is met and that should be the basis upon which decision making is undertaken. There are of course opportunities for parents where they feel dissatisfied with the decision making of a local authority to pursue those issues through the tribunal process. I obviously would uh, encourage local authorities and parents to try to resolve these issues but I do accept that in some cases it is necessary for these issues to be resolved at tribunal um, when all sides of the, consider of the uh, debate on the appropriate educational setting for young people can be heard and resolved. A supplementary from Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, as far as resources are concerned, Cabinet Secretary, for additional support for learning, can I first of all put on record my thanks to you personally for the efforts that you're making to assist with families uh, with the recent closure of the new school at Butterston. In light of that, and in some of the comments about additional support for learning across the country, will you undertake to have a formal review about the resources that are available for specialist education? John Swinney. I think we've got, well, first of all, I'm grateful to Liz Smith for her comments about the new school at Butterston. Uh, there are um, about 23 young people who are affected by the closure and obviously staff who are affected by the closure of that school. And on a daily basis, I am seeing reports from each local authority affected about the progress that's been made in finding appropriate educational settings for young people. And that uh, review work goes on on a daily basis. And uh, some progress has been made in some cases, but not in all cases. And it will take time to find appropriate placements for young people. I think it's important that we uh, keep under active review the options that are available for the placing of young people outside of mainstream education. And fundamentally, the, the law is clear that we should encourage uh, mainstreaming, but there are exceptions that are specified in the Standards and Schools Act 2000. And uh, I obviously want to maintain uh, an overview of the provision that is available in consultation with local authorities to make sure that there are options available to meet the needs of young people in such circumstances. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what action it's taken to support school children with mental health issues. John Swinney. President Officer, the Scottish Government is working to strengthen child and adolescent mental health. We know that prevention and early intervention make a big difference in reducing the risk of developing mental health problems. We are working collaboratively to provide access to counsellors in schools. This will complement the spectrum of mental health services already being provided in schools to ensure that every child and young person has access to emotional and well-being support in school. We are also continuing to support local authorities to access mental health first aid training for key staff. Gillian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Could he give an update on the commitment to have counsellors in every school and, and outline what impact that decision that the government's taken is designed to have on pupils and staff, particularly, as he said, a complement to existing pastoral care provision? John Swinney. Uh, President Officer, there is work actively underway to advance these commitments and we are working with key partners to identify the best use of resources and will publish a programme for delivery that will ensure that this commitment is met. 
Um, we said in the programme for government that we would set out uh, a delivery plan on all of the mental health commitments contained within the programme for government and that work is currently underway. One of the issues that we have to consider is how we make sure this investment is compatible with the existing arrangements which some schools have already taken forward as a consequence of their own decision making using pupil equity funding where they have seen the necessity of strengthening counselling services available for young people. That <laughs> investment has been made in some parts of the country and we need to make sure that the government's commitment dovetails and supports uh, that approach that has been taken. Supplementary from Mary Fee. Almost a third of children waited more than 18 weeks for access to mental health treatment between July and September of this year. Fewer children were treated within the target time this year than in 2017. When is the Scottish Government going to take its responsibility to young people seriously and act to meet the needs of school children with poor mental health? John Swinney. I, I think it should be pretty clear to Mary Fee from the commitments made in the programme for government that the government takes these issues deadly seriously. And the investment that's been announced by the government is in response to the very significant change in the pattern of presentation about mental health issues, which Mary Fee must be uh, aware of and can recognise as something that has changed dramatically in the course of the last few years within Scotland. Now, our focus is on early intervention to make sure that we can reduce the presentation of young people to CAMS, which I think all of us would agree would be the best intervention because the earliest we can intervene to support the mental and emotional well-being of young people, uh, the better it will be for those young people. So that's the agenda the government is pursuing. Uh, I think it's an agenda that's worthy of support and I invite Mary Fee to do exactly that. Question number three, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Education and Skills Committee report, Young People's Pathways, a progress report on developing the young workforce. Jamie Hepburn. We welcome the committee's inquiry and will consider their findings and recommendations in detail. We are committed to increasing the number of pathways available to young people through the Developing Young Workforce programme, with a particular focus on improving outcomes for those who face additional barriers when moving from education to employment. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for that answer. He will know that Aberdeen and Grampian have shown how much of a positive difference DYW can make, engaging, for example, with over 400 employers and creating real opportunities for many young people in the region. But he will also note the committee's report points out that that is not happening in other places. Does the minister agree with the committee that, that a greater sense of urgency in rolling that out is required? Jamie Hepburn. Well, let me say I, I take no sense of a lack of urgency in the rollout of developing young workforce. Starting from the top, this government is utterly committed to rolling out developing young workforce across Scotland. Yes, it is the case and it is inevitably going to be the case on a regional basis. Some areas of the country will be further ahead than others. Uh, Aberdeen and Grampian in the North East is a very good example. There are other great examples across the country as well. In fact, there are good examples of progress right across the length and breadth of the country. But yes, some areas are further ahead than others. And our task is to support the regional groups to ensure that they're learning from one another, learning best practice and rolling out the Developing Young Workforce programme as consistently and as far away as possible across the country. That's something this government is committed to. Supplementary, Willie Coffey. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister what role Skills Development Scotland will play in contributing to the development of a skilled and productive workforce in Scotland? Jamie Hepburn. Uh, well, Skills Development Scotland uh, play a, a critical role uh, in that, of course, in that they are discharged with the function of uh, contracting for modern apprenticeships. We are, of course, uh, committed to delivering 28,000 such opportunities this year as we move towards our target of 30,000 uh, by 2020. They are also involved in the provision of new graduate apprenticeships. They are also involved in the provision of foundation apprenticeships in the school environment. And, of course, they have a responsibility for careers, information and guidance. So they are critical to our developing young workforce agenda. Question number four wasn't lodged. Question number five, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its response to the vote in Parliament of 19 September 2018 opposing national standardised assessment for P1 pupils. John Swinney. Presiding Officer, on the 25th of October, I made a parliamentary statement announcing an independent review of P1 assessments. The review will consider all the evidence gathered and provide recommendations by May 2019. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We voted in this chamber to end the national assessment of five-year-olds, and yet still this government persists, arguably in contempt of this Parliament. So can I ask firstly that the government halt the programme of national assessment of P1s immediately and for the duration of that review? And can I also ask for a guarantee from the Cabinet Secretary that his government will attach no precondition to education funding on the delivery of these assessments, as it sometimes does in other policy areas, so that authorities considering abandoning these assessments unilaterally can do so without sanction. John Swinney. Um, well, what, where to start with that particular question? Um, the government, I set out in great detail the uh, views of the government in relation to the decision that was taken by Parliament on the 19th of September. It's no secret that I didn't think the debate was driven by educational considerations. I thought it was driven by politics. And what was clear to me in coming to that conclusion was that for a sustained amount of time in local authorities led by the Labour Party, the SNP, the Conservatives and the Liberals, and the Liberals, there were P1 standardised assessments that people didn't bat an eyelid to. So I think we've got to be careful that we don't take decisions uh, based on uh, political considerations in Parliament that may damage the educational journey of young people through our education system, because that would not serve young people at all well. So we've, I've invited other parties to give me input into the independent review. I'm grateful to the Conservatives, uh, to the Labour Party and to the Greens for providing me with input, which I'm currently considering with the Chief Inspector of Education, to make sure that we can build some broad agreement about how we uh, pursue the consideration of what I recognise to be an issue that divides opinion within Parliament, but where I'm determined to take a, come to a conclusion that is in the interest of children and young people in Scotland. I have two supplementary requests. If you could make them quick questions, please. Joanne Lamont, followed by Tom Arthur. I mean, I have to say to the, the Cabinet Secretary, it does him no uh, good at all to impugn the motives of those people who believe in educational terms that this policy is inappropriate. But given the current debate, and this is important uh, here and elsewhere about accepting the will of Parliament, will the Cabinet Secretary firstly outline on the basis of what advice did he decide to push ahead with P1 testing while his group sets about seeking the evidence to justify it? And would he not recognise that to respect the decision of the Scottish Parliament and the views of many families and teachers about this policy, it would be more appropriate to suspend primary one testing until at least his group reports? It, no, I, John I, I, I take entirely the opposite view because I think it's important as we undertake this exercise that we build the evidence base for that to be the case. And, an other, uh, and a further year of primary one standardised assessments, in my view, will help us to inform that judgment. In relation to the first point that Joanne Lamont raises with me, um, I reflected on what I consider to be in the light of the evidence I've taken from, for example, directors of education around the country, or the views that I've taken from many teachers around the country who view and value the information, and particularly the diagnostic information, that is available about the performance of primary one pupils, which then informs educational judgments made professionally about the next steps in learning of young people. And it's on those judgments that I, to, to which I attach significant weight in my, in my consideration of this issue. Tom Arthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the Deputy First Minister can um, give an update and an indication of how many opposition MSPs have taken up the offer to consult on the details of the remit of the review of the primary one assessments. John Swinney. Well, I, I, as I indicated in my earlier answer, I've had um, information and feedback from the Conservatives, the, Liberal, the Labour Party and the Greens on that. I'm reflecting on that to help to formulate a more broadly based assessment of this, uh, of this exercise so that we can come to an evidenced conclusion as a consequence. And I think that's an orderly way for me to respond constructively to the decision of Parliament. Uh, two things I would like to say here. Can we stop having private conversations uh, across desks, please? And also, when I request quick supplementaries, that is a request because it disadvantages other people when folk go on. Number six, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the last review of how probationer teachers are allocated was undertaken. John Swinney. 
President Officer, probationary teachers are allocated to local authorities through the teacher induction scheme on the basis of student choice and availability of posts. The allocation process has been in place since the inception of the teacher induction scheme in 2004. The teacher induction scheme ongoing review group has an ongoing role in monitoring the process and will continue to do so in the period ahead. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The current practice of telling schools in May how many probationers they're getting for the following year is severely restricting some rural schools in deciding their pupils' options forms and in setting their timetables. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider looking at changing the system so that schools can find out much earlier in the year how many probationers they are due to get, making it fairer and easier on both pupils and teachers? John Swinney. I obviously recognise the significance of the point that's raised by Gail Ross and I'm certainly very happy to ask the uh, review group to consider the issue that she has raised. Supplementary from Willie Rennie. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary understand why approximately a thousand probationer teachers in Scotland have quit the profession within the last three years? John Swinney. Well, obviously individuals will make judgments about uh, whether they are comfortable uh, in the employment choices that they have made. Uh, but we have, in the last census available, 88% of probationers in full-time employment um, after the completion of their probation period, which is um, a very high level, uh, much higher than it used to be, uh, I might add, uh, much higher than it used to be. Um, so I take from that that uh, many probationer teachers are motivated to make a constructive contribution to Scottish education, and they're very welcome in so doing. Question seven, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will make money available for a new Castle Bay High School before the 2021 new school building cycle. John Swinney. So, officer, through our Schools for the Future programme, the City of Edinburgh Council has been awarded over £63 million towards the construction of four school projects. My officials met with the local authority on the 29th of October to discuss its Wave 4 investment programme. On the 21st of November, I announced the new £1 billion learning estate investment programme and we will now work in collaboration with the local authority and other authorities to identify priority projects for investment. Kezia Dugdale. I'm afraid that doesn't address my question. Castle Bray hope to start building next year, but can't do that if they have to wait to 2021 for additional resources. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm, should they go ahead with the scale-back version of the school using capital receipts from the land and existing council money, or should they wait for him to turn up with some cash in two years' time? John Swinney. Well, that's fundamentally an issue for uh, the City of Edinburgh Council to decide. And uh, let me just point out to Kezia Dugdale, that since this government came to office, when this government came to office in 2007, there were 61% um, of schools in Scotland were in good or satisfactory condition. 61%. Today, it is now 84%. 84%. That is the scene. Now, I appreciate that Castlebury High School uh, wish to invest in the school. I quite understand that. But the City of Edinburgh Council has made some capital decisions of its own choice, which had nothing to do with me. They were their decisions to make in the relation to the use of their capital budgets, which are um, extensive resources that are available to them. But what I think Kezia Dugdale has got to accept is that this government has made significant progress in improving the school estate. Actually, I gave, I gave Kezia Dugdale the wrong figure there. It's not 84%, it's 86% that the government, it's even better than I thought the first time round. So the government is significantly enhancing the capital estate of our school buildings and obviously we will engage in discussion with the City of Edinburgh Council about the aspirations in Castle Bray. Question number eight, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to improve educational provision and experiences for young people with autism. John Swinney. Presiding Officer, we want all young people and children to receive the support needed to reach their full learning potential. We are taking a range of actions, including updating the autism toolbox to support those who work with children and young people with autism. I have considered the calls for action contained in the Not Included, Not Engaged, Not Involved report, and I am committed to ensuring these are addressed in the action underway to improve educational experiences for children and young people with autism. Oliver Mundell. Thank you. I, I hear the Cabinet Secretary talk about those calls for action. I wondered uh, off what he'd said if he could spell out which of the nine calls uh, he's supporting. 
um, and which of them uh, he'll be implementing with immediate effect. John Swinney. Uh, well, there are, of course, uh, as I explained in the parliamentary debate last night, a number of elements of the calls to uh, action in this respect which um, raise issues that are already incompatible with guidance on these questions. Um, particularly if we take, uh, for example, call number one, uh, the stopping of the use of unlawful exclusions and the inappropriate use of part-time timetables. Um, existing guidance uh, completely takes a different view to the practice that has been recounted in that particular call. So what I'm determined to do is to work with local authorities to ensure that there is a greater adherence to the existing arrangements that are in place. And if there is a need for us to change practice as a consequence of the uh, calls to action, uh, that is exactly what the government will consider. Supplementary from Daniel Johnson. Following on from Oliver Mandel's uh, question, I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that there is a clear need for initial teacher education to include both additional support needs, but in particular neurodevelopmental disorders, because that point was clear from last night's debate. It, John it, it, it's essential that initial teacher education uh, equips uh, teachers to support young people in our classrooms today. And it's very evident to me that there is a greater presentation of um, additional support needs. Uh, so there is therefore a necessity for not only teacher, teachers going through initial teacher education, but those going through uh, continuous professional development to be uh, cognizant of the issues that Mr. Johnson raises and to ensure that's reflected in the professional development of those charged with education. Question number nine, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the reported problems with teacher recruitment. John Swinney. We have taken substantive action to recruit and retain teachers through the Teaching Makes People campaign and have created new routes into the profession. There are now more primary and secondary teachers than at any time since 2014 and the ratio of pupils to teachers is at its lowest since 2013. We provide funding of £88 million per year to support councils to maintain teacher numbers. This resulted in 543 more teachers in 2017 than the previous year. The second consecutive year teacher numbers have increased. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. President Officer, when I submitted this question, I intended to ask about the hundreds of teaching posts in the North East that had to be re-advertised because of the SNP's chaotic workforce planning. But yesterday's Press and Journal revealed the unbelievable pressure on teaching assistants and the 21,000 teaching hours lost because of stress, depression and anxiety. Given those shocking figures, it's hardly surprising schools in the North East cannot recruit enough teachers to give the children the education they deserve. So will the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that my local schools are at breaking point and will they finally do something about it? John Swinney. Um, as I recounted in my earlier answer to Mr Kerr, uh, the government has taken action in this respect through the campaign to recruit more teachers into the profession. That campaign has been successful because we have 543 more teachers in our schools in 2017 than the previous year. Now, obviously, uh, we will see Mr Kerr uh, referred to vacancies in schools. Uh, there will be a vacancy survey will be published shortly, so we'll see uh, what, uh, what, if any, progress has been made in tackling vacancies. We will also see very shortly uh, whether any further progress has been made on the employment of teachers. And uh, obviously Mr Kerr can come back and ask me questions about that when the up-to-date information is to hand. But I do assure him that by designing new routes into teaching, by promoting the profession, and by setting out the strengths of Scottish education, uh, we are encouraging more individuals to join the profession as the data that I've already set out demonstrates. Supplementary, Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Teachers themselves, are very clear that the only action which will address the teacher recruitment problem is a restorative pay increase uh, for our teachers. So why then uh, has the Deputy First Minister not ensured an improved offer has been brought forward since the existing off offer was overwhelmingly rejected? John Swinney. Well, obviously we're in active negotiations with the teaching professional associations. There was a meeting of the SNCT on Monday. Uh, we work closely with our local authority colleagues in COSLA who are discussing the uh, offer that can be made to the teaching profession and obviously when we are in a position to make an offer to the teaching profession uh, that will be undertaken as part of the SNCT process when the offer is properly offered by the employers and that's COSLA, not me. Question number 10, Sandra White. 
Thank you very much, President Officer. To answer the Scottish Government what guidance it provides to local authorities regarding flexibility in the provision of funded childcare at nurseries. Marie Todd. The Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 introduced a duty on local authorities to consult with parents and carers to inform how they make early learning and childcare available in their areas. This is to ensure that the provision of funded ELC within an authority is flexible enough to allow families an appropriate degree of choice when deciding how to access the service. There is supporting statutory guidance to help local authorities to meet these duties. Sandra White. The Minister for that reply. Minister, I have met with a number of nurseries in my constituency and lots of concerns have been expressed by not just the providers but by parents as well in regards to the inflexibility of hours provided by Glasgow City Council and the difficulties this actually uh, puts forward for them. I wonder if the Minister would meet with me to talk over and discuss uh, the issues which has been raised by, by parents and providers in Glasgow City Council. Marie Todd. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would welcome a meeting with Sandra White to discuss these issues. But let me reiterate again, local authorities have a duty to consult with families um, to inform the delivery of funded ELC in their areas. And that should be reflected in the local authority expansion plans. That happens every couple of years. Flexibility should be driven by local demand from families regarding the nature and the type of provision that they require. And that should see a range of delivery models right across the authority. And let me also make clear uh, uh, again, as I have uh, several times in this chamber, our new funding follows the child approach will put the power into parental hands. So any funded provider who meets the national standard and has a place available will be able to um, it be chosen by parents for their child to go to nursery and education. There. Supplementary, Alison Harris. Thank you. Although private sector ELC providers offer the greatest flexibility, they have been ignored in capital funding decisions. In a meeting with the Minister yesterday, private providers said that in the various local authorities, the directors of education have refused to open any dialogue with them. The Minister insists that councils will eventually realise the expansion cannot be done without private providers. With the deadline fast approaching, does the Minister really think this eureka moment is going to happen on its own? And if not, when will she intervene to ensure it does? Marie Todd. Um, as you're aware from the meeting yesterday, I've written to all the councils in November um, to explain about um, capital funding. And I can report today, I've seen just in the press today, that Murray Council has brought forward some... Um, sorry? <laughs> no, we didn't know that yesterday. So, so there are several local authorities. There are local authorities bringing forward packages, um, and I, we will see progress on that. Uh, can I reiterate, please, that I don't like private conversations to be going on in the middle of question sessions. And go to question number 11, Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the number of modern apprenticeship places in the Stirling area. Jamie Hepburn. The published Modern Apprenticeship Statistics second quarter, which covers April September 2018, reported 225 new modern apprenticeship starts in the Stirling area, which is up from 212 at the same point the previous year. Including those already undertaking an apprenticeship as of 28th of September, there were 619 apprentices in training in Stirling. Bruce Crawford. I thank the Minister for that very helpful answer. Uh, can the Minister con confirm what the impact of the UK Government's apprenticeship levy has been on employers and apprentices in Scotland? Jamie Hepburn. Well, the most obvious impact on employers, at least for those with a payroll of £3 million or more, it has been that they are, are subject to paying uh, the levy, and that was without any prior consultation with them as to the, the likely impact. That includes the public sector in Scotland, which we estimate had to contribute £73 million in 2017-18. Of course, we get on uh, with the job. Uh, in Scotland, we are delivering more apprentice starts than ever before, with a record number of 27,145 starts last year up from 26,262. That's in contrast to the position in England which according to the Department for Education Statistics showed that between August 2017 and July 2018 there was a drop of 24.75 per cent in apprenticeship starts compared to the equivalent period the, la the previous year. Question number 12, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government further to the successful rebuilding of the Clyde and Broomhill Primary Schools in Glasgow Annie's Land, what progress has been made with the rebuilding of Blairdardie Primary School? 
Uh, can I remind members that they should read the question as written on the paper? John Swinney. So through our Scotland Schools for the Future programme, Glasgow City Council has been awarded over £5 million towards the construction of Blairdardie Primary School. The new school will be open to pupils in March 2019. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister for that reply. I welcome the Scottish Government's prioritisation of ensuring that the children of Scotland are educated in high quality, state of the art buildings. Can the Minister outline how the Scottish Government plans to continue to deliver the best quality school buildings for children post 2020 when the current funding phase of Schools for the Future ends? John Swinney. Uh, President officer, so far we've supported 117 schools across Scotland being rebuilt or refurbished and we have the lowest number of schools in unacceptable condition on record. Um, that is uh, a strong performance and it's led to the government announcing a new £1 billion learning estate investment programme which will fund new and refurbished schools across Scotland um, uh, after 2020. A dialogue with local authorities and with COSLA is underway to take forward that, uh, that proposal. Question number 13, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government how many additional apprenticeships have been funded by the apprenticeship levy. Jamie Hepburn. In 2017-18, there were 27,145 modern apprenticeship new starts in Scotland, up from 26,262 modern apprenticeship starts the year before. The increase was achieved in the context of a reduction in available public spending leeway in Scotland as a result of the UK Government's apprenticeship levy in April 2017. Uh, due to the public sector liability for the levy, public sector leeway expenditure was reduced by some £30 million in 2017-18. Despite this, the Scottish Government continues to utilise the notional sum allocated to the block grant related to the levy entirely for employability and training related activity. And this year, we'll support 28,000 modern apprenticeship starts. Rhoda Grant. That seems an incredibly small an amount for the levy that is being charged. I've been speaking to many organisations who have expressed disquiet over the levy. Some pay in and get very little out. Others can't access it at all because the age profile of their staff and apprenticeships does not fit the criteria. Um, and what's not clear is who is actually benefiting from this levy. Will the minister now sit down with those organisations and speak to them about how they can best use this levy to upskill their workforce? Jamie Hepburn. Well, let me say to Ms Grant, I'll sit down with any organisation that wants to discuss these matters with me any time. That's what I do. I do think it's unfortunate. It seems to have fallen susceptible to the idea perpetuated by the UK government that the levy somehow brought forth this bounty of new money available for the Scottish Government to spend. It did not. The money that came forward it largely replaced existing expenditure. It was, in fact, a new mechanism by which to raise uh, the funding. What I can say is we're delivering more apprenticeships than we ever have before. 27,145 last year. We'll deliver 28,000 this year. We'll deliver 30,000 by uh, 2020. I've already made the point of the significant reduction the number of apprenticeship starts in England down uh, nearly 25% between August 2017 and July 2018 last year. Given the levy was predicated on the assumption of an uplift in the number of apprentices in Scotland, nothing uh, in England, nothing to do with our <coughs> policy here in Scotland, given that they are clearly failing in England to increase the number, one might ask where that money is going in England. A cynic could argue that it's nothing more than a UK government treasury tax, uh, tax ploy. Short supplementary, please, from Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Following uh, my letter to the First Minister about the hurdles faced by small businesses in ass uh, assessing uh, apprenticeships, the Minister replied that uh, he'd met with the FSB uh, in July and that his officials would be working with SDS to explore the scope for focused modern apprenticeships, uh, 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 apprenticeship week on small business opportunities. So given that apprenticeship week is only a few months away, can I ask the Minister to update the Chamber on what proposals will be made regarding the next apprenticeship week? Uh, can I just say that uh, short questions doesn't just mean speak faster? <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Hepper. I I'll take that on board, uh, President Officer. Uh, dialogue continues. Uh, Apprenticeship Week uh, will come in due course. There is dialogue between the government, FSB and SDS on an ongoing basis. I'm very clear that our small and medium enterprises should benefit by apprenticeships. They have that opportunity. And just as I've said, I'm always willing to engage with the organisations that with the grant uh, alluded to, I'll always be willing to discuss these matters with the FSB as well. Question number 14, Richard Lyon. 
Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to mitigate the impact on universities and colleges in Scotland of the UK leaving the EU. Richard Lockhead. We are doing everything in our power to mitigate the damage of Brexit and to protect Scotland's interests, not least by confirming that eligible EU students starting undergraduate course at a university in Scotland in autumn 2019 will still have their tuition fees paid for the whole of their course. The simple truth, however, is that Brexit represents such a level of threat to our colleges and universities that we must be clear that no amount of mitigation will stop Brexit damaging our world-class institutions. And we will, of course, continue to discuss these issues with our sectors and staff and students, as we did most recently at the Brexit Summit at the University of Glasgow. And I will also lead a delegation to Brussels next week to strengthen relationships with European stakeholders and ensure Scotland's voice is being heard. Richard Lyle. The Scottish Secretary of Unison said, in the massive risk register associated with Brexit, the interests of EU nationals working across education, delivering quality public services, require to be front and centre. Would the Minister agree that the senseless scrapping of important policies like the post-study work visa will leave Scotland worse off? Richard Lockhead. Well, Richard Lyle highlights a very important aspect. I've just said in my previous answer that the government's committed to paying the tuition fees for EU students from 2019 onwards for the course of degrees. So we could be in a ludicrous position where we to depart the EU or have a bad deal that we would not be able to have these students contributing to Scottish society if we did not have the ability to give uh, out post-study work visas. And that's why the Scottish Government's been vociferous in calling for their reinstatement. Uh, the, fact, the hard fact is that uh, departing from the EU will have a disproportionate impact on Scottish and further higher education in Scotland. And that's why this afternoon's debate is so crucially important for Scotland's future. Question number 15, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the finances of schools in the North East Fife constituency. John Swinney. President Officer, schools in North East Fife will be required to make the best use of the resources available to them by Fife Council, which set an education budget of £337 million for 2018 19, which was an increase of over £6 million on the previous year. Fife benefits from funding through the Attainment Scotland Fund as part of our £750 million commitment to help close the poverty-related attainment gap. In 2018-19, schools in the North East Fife constituency received £894,000 in pupil equity funding. Willie Rennie. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary understand the anger amongst my constituents that not only are Fife secondary schools facing cuts of £1.2 million when the government says that education is a priority, but almost half of those cuts are being imposed on three North East Fife schools of Wade Academy, Bell Baxter and Madras College. Does the Minister think it's fair and reasonable for head teachers to face such dramatic cuts when it's supposed to be a government priority? John Swinney. Uh, fundamentally, Willie, Willie Rennie raises an issue with me, which is the responsibility of Fife Council. As I've indicated, Fife Council have increased their education budget by over £6 million in 2018-19. And obviously distribution issues within Fife are a matter entirely for Fife Council over which the government has no jurisdiction. What I would say to Willie Rennie is the government is making a direct investment in the education of young people and closing the attainment gap in his constituency to the tune of £894,000. And I know from my experience of assessing the work that is being undertaken by schools in Mr Rennie's constituency, it is making a significant impact on the well-being and the attainment of young people. Question number 16, Morris Corey. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how Skills Development Scotland supports veterans. Jamie Hepburn. Uh, Skills Development Scotland are a key member of the Scottish Government's Veterans Employability Strategic Group, uh, which focuses on improving employment opportunities and support for veterans in Scotland. In addition to ensuring all their services are veteran friendly and establishing a veterans web portal, SDS are working with the Career Transition Partnership on a pilot on the A96 corridor, which offers a guidance interview to service leavers which enhances the service they already receive from the career transition partnership. SDS will continue to work closely with that partnership and MOD delivery staff to ensure those leaving the armed forces are aware of all the services that are available to them. Maurice Corey. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Scottish Government set out its plans for veteran skills development early last year in its response to the veterans community employability skills and learning issue. Does the Scottish Government have any intention to update or check the progress of those proposals? Jamie Hepburn. 
Uh, yes, the uh, Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veterans delivered his annual update to Parliament in September. Uh, the report is available uh, for public consumption through uh, the government's uh, website, and there will uh, continue to be uh, updates uh, on relation to the, the work of the Veterans uh, Commissioner and the Employability uh, Group on the progress of uh, the employability recommendations of the, the Commissioner. So, yes, there will be ongoing and continuous uh, updates in relation to that work. That concludes portfolio questions. If we could quickly adjust our seats, please.